Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, this morning's webinar. Delighted to be with you today for this discussion about Decade After Defeat, Japan 1945 to 1955. And we're so fortunate to have as our guest today, Professor Yoshikuni Igarashi. So I want to say a little bit about him, introduce him to you, and, and then we'll get started for what we, we think will be a very rich uh, discussion. And then we'll hear from you from with your questions for our guest. Professor Igarashi is professor of history at Vanderbilt University and is also affiliated with the Asian Studies program there. His research focuses on Japanese cultural history during the interwar and post-World War II periods. And I want to note among his many publications, his three monographs. His first book, Bodies of Memory, Narratives of War in Post-War Japanese Culture, 1945 to 1970, appeared with Princeton University Press in 2000. And I'd like to make our audience aware of the fact that my colleague and friend here at the Museum's Institute for the Study of War and Democracy, Jennifer Popowitz, reviewed this book for our website. So some of you who are interested in that review will be able to find, find that piece on our website. His second book was called Homecomings, The Belated Return of Japan's Lost Soldiers with Columbia University Press in 2016. And then just this past year, 2021, saw the publication of his latest monograph, Japan Circa 1972, Masculinity in the Age of Mass Consumption and Made of Visuality, which really deals with the transformation of Japanese society in the late 1960s and early 1970s, focusing on mass consumerism. So with that, Yoshi, welcome. It's great to have you today. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the, the, uh, the National World War II Museum and Jason and Jeremy for having me and making it possible to share my work. I'm excited. We're, yeah, we're delighted to have you today, Yoshi. I'm excited as well. And we're dealing with a very important decade in Japan's modern history, for that matter, really world history, given Japan's uh, surprising for many alliance with the United States during the early phase of the Cold War. It's a decade that is maybe not so well known to Americans, even those who have a, a really deep interest in the Second World War. And so Yoshi, you're sharing your expertise with us today will help us all, I think, understand this 10 years uh, better than we had previously. So where I'd like to start, as you've given the fact so much happens with this decade, is right at the end of the Second World War, Yoshi, and that is with the famous speech that Emperor Hirohito gives on August 15, 1945, where he announced to the Japanese people the country's surrender, and he stressed the burden of, quote, having to bear the unbearable. And what I'd like to ask here is that after eight years of war, and we shouldn't lose sight of the fact here in the US that Japan had been at war long before Pearl Harbor, had been at war in China since July of 1937, that after these eight years of war, what do you think we can say about how much support the Japanese state still enjoyed from its people at that time? That's a very interesting question. On one level, we can say that a large majority of people were determined to fight to the bitter end. That this we can uh, tell from the, the, the contemporary accounts, which express sort of sense of dismay hearing the news of Japan's surrender. That's one level. But if you look at the sort of deep, deeper level, sort of emotional level, or not no, perhaps in different level in the economy and social level, you start seeing different picture here. For example, uh, toward end of the, uh, the war, particularly 1945, late 1944, 1945, Japanese industry suffered from high absentee rate, absenteeism. So uh, there are various reasons for this, but the perhaps big reason was people just did not believe in the cause of the war and they just decided not to show up at their work. 
So the numbers at some industries, some uh, the factories as high as or higher than 50%. And those are not numbers that can sustain industry. So that's another sort of a, you know, different kind of story going on. And another thing is the poli police reports, which uh, tell us, you know, sort of a complaints and unhappy feelings shared among the people in their private conversations. There are so many examples of those. And those things are co coexisting in communities as well as perhaps in the same individual. So we can maybe call this, you know, the cognitive dissonance. But on one level, yes, they are determined to fight, but another level or other levels, they are beginning to see this is not sustainable. So you know, it's hard to say how to, you know, you cannot say Japan was like this, Japan was like that. It was very much sort of a mixture of complex emotions. Yeah, Yoshi, your comment, I think, cautions us against assuming some monolithic posture on the part of the Japanese people by this very late, really at the, the kind of end of the war, that there is this kind of, as you put it, cognitive dissonance and a kind of growing discontent that's being registered on many levels. And Japanese authorities are aware of this growing discontent, as you mm -hmm. point out. And that cognitive dissonance is also going to provide some opportunities for, for America, the American occupation and also for Japanese who had been opposed to the course of Japanese policy during the 30s and 40s to really push for change in the immediate post-war period. And obviously we'll be able to address some of those changes here shortly. So with that, I think most Americans, Yoshi, when they think of the end of the war, they're of course always going to flash to the surrender ceremony on the USS Missouri on mm -hmm. September 2nd, 1945 in Tokyo Harbor. We also know that three weeks after the surrender, that General Douglas MacArthur, who was then transitioning into a, a brand new role as Supreme Commander of Allied Powers in Tokyo, um, met with Emperor Hirohito. Can, this meeting itself was so um, salient, so significant for what was going to come in terms of relations between the two countries. Could you tell us about why this meeting was so significant and what transpired there? Um, okay, so that meeting was made into a significant, significant you know, sort of um, given a, how the, the, the um, let me back up a little bit. The me meeting was important because MacArthur later said it was. And uh, this is sort of a part of the, I need to back up to explain this scene to 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 read uh, to sort of get really get into this scene. So the premise of my argument is that no, we have to really think about this transition. U.S. and Japan used to be two of the most hated enemies, mutually hated enemies in the Pacific, up until the last minute. But comes the end of the war, uh, several weeks after the war, or several months, I should say two nations became the closest allies in the Pacific. And that's, to think about it, a very, very strange situation. But now we don't really think about it. Uh, yeah, they came to terms and then they created new alliances. But go back to that moment to think about the, you know, this is like a, a squaring a circle. Something must give, something must be really forced into something else. So what I emphasize in my argument is that the new or a narrative was created to explain this transition to the Japanese as well as Americans. And this scene, scene what became one of the central scenes to explain, uh, be part of that narrative. So getting back to scene, uh, historians sort of, uh, you know, dived into look for what actually was said between the two to people. So MacArthur's account is this. Basically, Emperor Hiroshito was there to sacrifice himself. And um, reclaiming all responsibilities of war, he doesn't care whatever you know, happens to him, but he's there to assume all the responsibilities. 
this is a very heroic night, a heroic tale. MacArthur told people around him as well as he talked about this in his memoirs later on. But reality was not at all like that. The historians tell us um, that most likely what Hirohito said at the moment was um, much simpler. Well, I tried my best, but we can had come down to the war. I regret the situation. So that's the nature of what he said, quite different from what MacArthur told other people. And uh, so how that articulation turned into MacArthur's sort of a touting emperor as this heroic figure, that's part of the transformation. MacArthur and Hirohito came into, uh, came um into this meeting or it, they coming together needing themselves each other Hirohito needed MacArthur's authority to protect himself from the impending war trials war crimes trials so he needed to make sure that MacArthur is on his side and MacArthur needed Hirohito to make sure that the, his um occupation policies would go smoothly and also he needed to reinforce his, reestablish his authority in relation to other nations, allied nations. So he needed the authority, cultural authority, as well as cooperation from the, the, the emperor. So they sort of saw themselves as, you know, they can help each other. But MacArthur already knew, you know, prior to the meeting, this meeting was ha happened September 27th. Prior to this meeting, he already knew, but no, Emperor Hirohito was on board. He's willing to support American policies. So there was no, nothing, no substance in the actual meeting. They, did not, they didn't have any need to talk about substance in, on the actual meeting of the 27th. So most likely this was you know, more like a ceremonial, rich, more like a ritual. They met, took picture, and uh, they exchanged niceties. But once again, this was turned into huge deal through the process of transforming Japan and emperor into a democratic entities. It's so interesting, Yoshi, about kind of demythologizing the way this September 27th meeting has typically you know, been represented, but also reminding us that, that both figures in some ways needed each other, even though the the level they were in obviously very um their their positions certainly were not equal at all by this mm -hmm. point but they did need each other and how that mutual need plays out is, is something we certainly want to to follow up on and with that i think we get into something about the the nature of american occupation policy yoshi and the role that hirohito and others from Japan's elite will, uh, what, what role they will play in this. So MacArthur and the, and the Truman administration organized much of their plans for the occupation of Japan around two basic principles, democratization and demilitarization. So why don't we start with democratization? So can you tell us about the kind of democratic revolution? It's really a, a remarkable thing, the kind of democratic revolution that starts in Japan in the fall of 1945, and about how Japanese political leaders responded to this transformation of their country's institutions. Sure. Um, yes, this process was very far reaching and by and large very successful. And uh, I should emphasize, underscore the fact that this success is also supported by Japanese participants, Japanese bureaucrats, politicians, and Japanese people. So yes, Americans were, you know, sort of a impetus, uh, brought this sort of a energy as far as plans, but they were carry, carried out by Japanese and also embraced by Japanese. So several things I can talk about, you no, know, probably I don't have time to get into details, but I can sort of point out uh, some people feel the successful things like land reform, uh, empowering labor movement, labor unions, also enfranchising, enfranchising you know, the women, the, uh, the, the voting right to women, uh, giving voting right to women, 
and uh, changing economic structures, um, namely uh, busting and divest the large, huge conglomerates in Japanese uh, economic system. And also new constitution was adopted and uh, this sort of uh, became the basis of new political system. So quickly, just let me talk about the land reform and the new constitution as a contrast. Uh, land reform is the one good example that this was already going on during the wartime period. Um, so when Americans came into Japan, um, Japanese bureaucrats were ready to work on land reforms and uh, they presented their own plans without any nudge. And then basically Americans just watched on side, sidelines and then things carried out very successfully. And because this was already going on during the wartime period, you now part of this is that the wartime regime has to keep the, the peasants or the farmers have, you know, happy, right? They had to somehow get them to make sure they will support wartime regime or efforts. So they were giving more and more incentives or the basis for tenant farmers and small scale farmers. And so land reform in the post-war period is by and large an extension of what was going on wartime period. So this is a good example of, you know, Americans tapping into sort of desire that already existed in Japanese society. And the new constitution is a little different. And this is the story told many times, many different places, but uh, this is American based, meaning that the MacArthur originally told Japanese government to come up with the new constitution, but Japanese government did not take it seriously. And MacArthur was upset. Therefore, he told his man, a woman, uh, his team, about 2,000 people, to come up with a blueprint constitution. So American team had only two, excuse me, about a week or so to come up with a new constitution, uh, the plan. And so they did. And that became the basis of Japan's new constitution. Yes, it was very democratic in many ways, advanced, but this relationship or the sort of a hand in making constitution sort of a became issue later on in Japan's discussion of the constitution. Some claim that this is American, others claim that no, this is Japanese. Japan actively embraced it and negotiated, changed the details. So it's Japanese, as Japanese as it could be. So between the two, you know, there's been some controversies, but perhaps we can take constitution as more of the top-down approach to the democracy, land reform as the bottom-up approach to democracy in between many different kind of policies are instituted and by and large, they are very successful. Yeah, that point about the success of these things, Yoshi, it, I think a lot of Americans lose sight of the fact that prior to the, the radical nationalists really becoming so powerful in Japan, starting in the late 1920s, early 1930s, but Japan had a constitution and it had a parliament and it had trade unions and it had liberal and leftist parties that were certainly competing for support. It had an industrial working class. So it had all of these things already you know, at one point, and they were some 20 years removed from that. I mean, during this period of authoritarianism, but I, I see your point very well that, that for many Japanese, they could feel like that this democratization move was in many ways reclaiming tendencies that had been at work already and were stymied by the kind of right-wing nationalist forces in Japan and your, your comments I think ensure that we don't lose sight of that, that all of a sudden the Americans just don't invent democracy in, in modern Japan. That leads us then to the second point, the second principle, which is demilitarization. And this takes us to your 2016 book, Homecomings, that I alluded to earlier at the outset. There you've written quite powerfully about the effort to bring home the staggering number of Japanese service members stationed outside of Japan when World War II ended. So I have two questions here. Can you convey to our audience how this massive task uh, 
really did play out in the immediate post-war years, bringing these service members home. And then the second one is the, the special difficulties involved in securing the return of Japanese soldiers in Soviet captivity. All right, so uh, once again, I think going back to uh, where Jason, you started, basically war ended, but you know, the, the ending the war is not like a closing spigot, a water stopping water. Um, the momentum is built and it's really, really difficult to really bring society, uh, country back into the state of peace. And uh, one of the biggest problems Japan, Japanese society faced was this people left overseas. So all together, uh, about 6.9 million people were left outside of Japan, existing as living or they stayed outside of Japan, and which is about 9.6% in, in relation to those people who lived within Japan. Now, almost 10% of people, and of which of 6.9, 6.3 million people eventually came back by the end of 1948. 6.3 million people came back to Japan. That's posed a huge challenge because Japanese economy was in shambles. They cannot just you know, casually sustain that large number of people. Yes, in the end, they absorbed the people, but for several years, this was a very difficult period for Japanese as well as returnees. And what made it difficult for returnees is this. Returnees, especially soldiers, um, you know, 3.7 million soldiers came back from overseas after the end of the war. They represented something that Japanese society did not want to see in the post-war period. They represented Japan's last war. Japan's cruelty, Japan's sort of violence. And they brought back, they represented, they embody Japan's violence. So nobody really wanted to talk about that aspect of returnees. So yeah, some of them are treated as poor victims, but by, by and large, they didn't have, Japanese society did not have kind of framework, language to talk about the difficult experiences that returnees experience. For example, you know, the concept of trauma did not exist. It was not a household world. It was really difficult in that kind of condition to register one's difficulty in coming back and all the dealing ways what they experienced in the war. So in many ways, their struggle started after they came back to Japan. And the second point, the, the people who are kept by Soviet Union after the war. So Soviet Union intentionally kept more than half a million Japanese. The number is dispute, disputed. Official number is supposed to be 540,000, but I believe the number was bigger. And that large number of Japanese, uh, mostly men, some women, were kept by Soviet Union because Soviet Union needed a labor force to rebuild the nation. And so they were kept at the labor camps spread out throughout the Soviet Union over, you know, there's about 2000 labor camps. They are spread out and they are put to work one, two years. And some of them stayed as long as 11 years, but most of them came back by, let's say 49. But initial two, uh, a couple initial year, initial, especially first winter for those people who that were left in Soviet Union were very difficult because of the food shortage, uh, disruption of the uh, distribution channel and the corruption, all that things contributed to the very difficult condition. You know, they had you know, sort of a, just basically their existence became a matter of survival. They are just there work and also just to survive this first winter. So many people perished. And uh, official figure is something like 60,000 people died at camps or during the tran transportation. But I, once again, I believe the number was a little higher than that. And uh, the difficulty of bringing those Soviet captives was uh, that Japan and Soviet Union did not have the, um, did not establish the, the, the diplomatic relations 
till 1956. So allied nations uh, applied pressures, pressure and Japan tried to negotiate, but those efforts did not come to fruition till 1956. That's when the last 3,000 people were brought back to Japan. That's a, just an incredible um, chronology that you've given us there, Yoshi. I mean, you're talking uh, 11 years after the war's over before all of the, the Japanese captives. And I think you're pointing out here that they were obviously service members in Soviet captivity, but some civilians, and women that were also included in that number. And it took a, over a decade to get them all home. And especially many of them, the kind of trauma they had experienced in terms of the you know exposure, labor, et cetera, maltreatment was uh, was truly scarring. And then, so I think this is I'm sure something that I think our audience would be curious about too. This issue about returnees, about bringing these Japanese soldiers, sailors, et cetera, airmen back home. I think we'll probably hear more from that during uh, the last part of our webinar. Yeah. So so you know the the, the war did not end in August 1945. To some people, what well, did not end you know, decades later, until decades later. So this is one example that you know, this end of the war is very much not defined moment, but something that has to be negotiated, something has to be realized by um, the efforts of so many people. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Yoshida, but we shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking that there is some neat cut off mm -hmm. for terminating a world war and that in, in this case this really does go on for years and years and with that in mind i wanted to ask you about the returnees and my question here is really about the hurdles they faced back in japan about reintegrating about again becoming part of Japanese society. Can you tell us a bit about what they faced? Yes, uh, so the, e, the cl uh, clearest example is the people who came back from Siberia, Soviet Union. They were discriminated against. Um, once again, they represented the war that the Japan did not want to think about anymore. But on top of that, they established, they basically, you know, was became, they were associated with the Soviet Union communism. So many employers were reluctant to hire those men because they were afraid, okay, they may harbor this communist ideals. Yeah, you know, there's a so much, so many, so much discussion, discussion about the um, brainwashing, the retaining the, uh, the captives in Soviet camps. So, and Yes, true. Some of them came back, came back home as the diehard communists. Because of that, now that association is, you know, is applied to everybody else. And uh, employers became very suspicious of these people who came back to the Soviet Union, and they just did not want to touch them. So therefore, they struggled to gain employment um, when they came back. And uh, other civilians came back from, for example, Manchuria. In some ways, um, again, they were uh, associated with wartime regime, as well as, you know, they are, you know, there's a sense that they deserve what they got. You know, they had a good time. They sort of benefited from wartime regime during the war. Therefore, you know, they started losing everything once the war was over. Okay, they deserve what they got at the end of the war. So in all, Japanese society was not at all sympathetic, not really extending sympathy toward those people, what kind of experiences they, they carried home. So there's sort of a, you know, the wall between the two, two segments of societies. This is a fascinating point, Yoshin, I think in another context, um, it would be interesting to even just think about the comparing the case of of these returnees with say those in Germany, mm -hmm. you know, coming back 1945, including many of them um, in Soviet captivity for a similar time until 1955, 
or so before many of them return and, and what they what they encounter once they do. It's such a it's such a really um, difficult story to to think about and, and how a society that's been defeated welcomes back uh, the members of its armed forces who had been in captivity or had been stranded someplace else when the, the war ends. So with these two principles in mind, Yoshi, democratization and demilitarization, I'd like to kind of bring these two together here in terms of the Japanese constitution of 1946, and you've already mentioned it, you know, as one outcome and, and the debate about how American is that constitution and how Japanese is that constitution. But could you hear, kind of take us through what this new constitution entailed for Japanese society and politics? And I think a lot of our audience would be very curious about what happened to the power of the emperor and the once all-powerful Japanese military. So let's start with the emperor. So in the pre-war 1889 constitution, emperor was defined as sovereign. He is the one who, no, he is a sovereign power and in the, in the empire, but that's gone in the new constitution. In the new constitution, he was defined as a symbol of nation's unity. And now there's a debate as to, there was a debate, there's been debate as what that exactly mean to be a symbol. And that, but that's, that's a side point aside. Point aside. Um, so from the sovereignty symbol, sovereignty was given to the Japanese people. So that gave really the basis of post-war Japanese uh, democracy. And the second point is Japan's military. What happened to that? Well, that's gone. Uh, the famous Article 9 of Japanese constitution, post-war constitution, explicitly says that Japan denounces the, a war as a means to settle international conflict, international disputes, and uh, for, forbid having the uh, maintaining sea and land forces. So constitution-wise, Article 9 forbid Japan sort of uh, prevent Japan from having any form of military. But in reality, for example, Japan self-defense forces right now is the huge military forces. That's the reality. So something happened between Article 9 and the development of the self-defense forces. And that sort of uh, evolves sort of part of the evolution of American policy that came after the adoption of constitution. But going back to the constitution, constitution that Japan sort of uh, adopted in 1946 and uh, made it in effect 1947 was very democratic, perhaps more democratic than American constitution in some ways. For example, it has the article about the academic freedom. Also, it includes the, the uh, gender equality. Some of the things the American, you know, there's the, that, that they are very cutting edge in some ways. So yes, that was a very um, refreshing as well as, um, you know, in a way, Japanese people were very excited. Many Japanese people were very excited about this constitution because number one, it make, makes it clear Japan is a new place, sort of breaking away from the tradition. Number two, Japan is now establishing itself as a democratic, peace-seeking nation. So all in all, this was a very refreshing change to many Japanese people. Yeah, there you've reminded us, Yoshi, about these stereotypes. Uh, some of them still you'll see appear in the United States about the inherent authoritarianism of the Japanese character, and of course, you often heard things said similarly about about Germany um, as well. And yet, your comments here are indicating, in fact, a very quick and very enthusiastic response on the part of many Japanese to democratization and to this new constitution and the new freedoms. In some cases, um, really new for not just Japan but for much of the world at the time. 
that there was a, a great degree of not just acceptance, but really, you know, positive support for those. So with that, then, Yoshi, because we're getting kind of further now along in our timetable, the issue, of course, that always comes up is the that of trying Japanese elites involved in the war and prosecuting the war about bringing them to justice. And so in terms of talking about reactions from the Japanese public, what can we say about how that public reacted to the trials of Japanese leaders, such as the probably the best known here in the US, the trial of the 25 defendants before the Tokyo Tribunal? I think the, the general reaction to the uh, tribunals was very positive or some sense of acquiescence. I, don't, I haven't seen much of pushback or the criticisms which came later, but at that moment, the trials were happening. I think the public opinions, uh, public uh, criticisms are muted. And uh, yes, uh, this is part of the psyche, part of the sort of a desire to move on by identifying the culprits who brought everybody into this misery and punish them and move on. And that desire was strongly there. And also Americans, American occupiers made sure that this trial will be supported by Japanese people. So they propagated you know, sort of their version of justifications, why they needed this and what does this do. Also, that lastly, uh, some of the events or the historical facts came out of the trial procedures were very shocking. For example, example a good example is Nanji, Man, Nanji Massacre. And uh, that event was not covered by Japanese media contemporaneously in 1937-38. So when this news came out finally, many people were shocked. So all in all, many people saw good reasons Good, you know, for this uh, procedures or the um, uh, the tribunals to go forward. Yeah, one might assume Yoshi, and you should feel just correct me if you, if I'm going too far in this direction that the revelation of of these atrocities perpetrated by the the Japanese military would have in turn enhanced the this peace culture that was already growing in Japan and kind of distrust of the military, certainly with the, the feet, et cetera, that these things would have kind of become reinforcing in, mm -hmm. in, in a way, right? With, with these things coming out and much of the Japanese public having no knowledge of them uh, prior to the, to the trials. It's such an interesting yeah, so, so in many people's mind, those leaders were guilty already. Uh, so when at the beginning of the session, uh, the tribunals, uh, the, the, uh, the defendants declared not guilty. And that, that declaration was needed to go into proceeding. But Japanese people were, many of them were outraged. How dare they say they are not guilty? So that shows that they already thought these people are guilty of the, you know, what they did during the wartime period. Yes, at this point, at least here in this kind of immediate post-war period to a real break, um, does it not re really with, you know, the support for the Japanese military and the kind of openness to some new politics here, which you've already been pointing us to, Yoshi. And, but the Cold War really does complicate all of this immensely and, and the development of this um, pattern of cooperation and, and alliance with the U.S. And so I wanted to ask here about, in fact, the, the onset of the Cold War in 1947 and how that initiated a major shift in U.S.-Japan relations. And how do you think on, on this issue, how Japan really fit into American strategic thinking, which after 1947 really becomes based around the notion of containing communism, mm -hmm. keeping it from spreading. 
Yes, 47 was a turning point in occupation policies. And uh, well, MacArthur went into Japan with this great idealism that he was determined to convert, transform Japan into a peaceful nation, agricultural nation, like uh, Switzerland of, of Asia. That was his vision. And he got to work immediately and uh, pushing his agenda. And 47 came and the situation around him, around Japan quickly changed, but he was reluctant to give up on his vision, but the pressure was mounting and eventually he relinquished. He changed his mind, he changed the directions. And with that, that the sort of occupation policies, uh, uh, you know, what they call is reverse course, reversal of occupation policies happened. So for example, um, today is, uh, February 1st, and 70, exactly 75 years ago on this day, Japanese labor unions were planning to have a national strike, nationwide strike. But day before, January 31st, MacArthur stepped in, declared that will be illegal because the fear was that the, if general strike, general strike happens, that will only contribute to the uh, instability, you know, mess up Japan's economy, and that will lead to instability, political instability. That will be only conducive to communist ideas, communists. So in order to stop that, you know, the general strike must be stopped. So yes, MacArthur stepped in, intervened, and stopped it. And that shows the degree in which he, you know, basically his hands are tied. He has to act, he has to basically um, make sure that the, all the parties involved in Japan's policies will be on the same page. It really is remarkable seeing this uh, turning point and the, the cooperation you'll see between the, you know, Japan and the US during the Korean War and the early 1950s and, and obviously beyond. I have one final question here, Yoshi, and then we're gonna see what our audience, we're seeing some questions already coming in. And this kind of points ahead, really, not only during this decade after defeat, but far beyond that, which is that you've done a lot of work on the distinctive form of capitalism and consumerism, really is so influential that develops in Japan after World War II. Could you say something just in sense of an overview? Yoshi, about this new kind of consumerist society in Japan, which I think this is actually a Japan that many Americans are very familiar with in their own ways, and in many cases uh, know extremely well or very curious about. Yes, uh, since we're running out of time, uh, I'll make it quick. So for Japan, Japanese people, uh, economy became a sort of substitute uh, arena for politics. Uh, so I would say, I would claim that the uh, Japan's nationalism was expressed through economic activities. So, you know, because of this strange transformation, to think about Japan's, uh, you know, to talk about politics in a possible period, that will always lead to this reality, Japan lost the war. Politically, Japan is transformed into subservient uh, and put into subservient position in relation to the United States. So if you think about what if one thinks about the politics surrounding Japan, within Japan, there's this reality. So rather than dealing with that, facing that, many people focused on economy, economic success. So by excelling economically, they found solace, they found new way of expressing nationalism. So that's you know, national, the economic nationalism that became very important component of Japan's society, Japanese society as well as Japanese you know, psyche in the post-war period. That said, United States was an inspiration for Japan's economy, economic success, especially consumer culture. So many of the things Americans introduced uh, Japanese people too became, you know, uh, inspirational. So part of that is trying to replicate American success. But 
At the same time, Japan was not, Japanese people are not trying to replicate exactly the same thing as US has. So yes, Japan embraced and rep reproduced, um, produced its own consumer culture, but I would, I would submit that Japan's version was quite different from American version. It was Japanese consumer culture. So we can put them both in the category of consumer culture, but Japanese producers and consumers were quite conscious of what they're doing in terms of, you know, what they're doing is very Japanese brand of economy, Japanese brand of consumerism. It's been such an enormously influential export as well. Yoshi, I don't need to be telling you that. Have you written so extensively on this? And one sees it all over the place, how uh, widespread this consumerist culture, Americans, people in, I mean, all across the world interested in Japanese film and animation, music. It's just a, a remarkable thing. Obviously, automobiles, electronics, we could just add this very long list. But our, our audience is weighing in now considerably, Yoshi, and we already have several questions here. Okay. So I thought we would shift to uh, the Q&A and let them have a chance to interact with you some. So starting out first, Yoshi, I have a question from Connor, and he's curious about how much impact, this goes back to the very beginning of our conversation about how much impact did the Soviet decision to attack Japan in August 1945, you think, have, obviously here in the US, there's always obviously the focus on the dropping of the two atomic bombs, but how much of an impact did the Soviets have on the Japanese decision to surrender? I think that was a big a part of this decision-making process. Now in the US, I think there's so much emphasis placed on the atomic bombs, but to, we cannot isolate atomic bombs and say they alone brought Japan to its knees. I think we have to see the whole picture. And uh, to say that the atomic bomb ended the war is erroneous because what about the 140,000 American soldiers who sacrificed their lives, right? I, the way I see the whole situation is like this. Um, atomic bomb is like a cherry on top of the cake. Yeah, it, it's the final thing. But the cake, you have to pay attention to the cake. And I think the Soviet uh, entering into war, it's part of this big cake. So we have to see the whole thing. And Soviet was perhaps, you know, we definitely a big part of this cake at the end, if we close to the top. Is we need to have a comprehensive view of all of those events, developments happening. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, this is part of the, uh, the justification that created after the war. Um, the, yes, we all know that the history is messy process. There are so many moving parts and so many actors and actresses. And uh, you know, it's chaos, chaotic. And to find a sort of a path through it is very difficult. But in the post-war period, um, the, the, the policymakers try to make to simplify this whole process and just selectively represent certain facts so that they try to justify their decisions during the war. Thank you for that, Yoshi. That takes us then to a question from Christopher. And this comes to the issue of Japan's constitution that we discussed about the implications of Article 9 and what you think the implications of Article 9 are on the kind of ability of Japan to defend itself without American assistance. But thank you for that uh, the questions. Uh, thank you for all questions. But um, Article 9, short term was a, um, this is going back to the, the history part, but the, uh, and the, uh, the changing uh, American occupation policies. So when the Korean War broke out in 1950, that's when MacArthur decided to order Japanese government to create the police reserve which was nothing but military. So despite the fact that Americans you know, imposed it Article 9, Americans came back and told Japanese to create a military again. And uh, from there on, basically US-Japan relationship is um, determined by this military, I won't say alliance, but the relationship 
So the premise or the whole base of the national energy, Japan as such is created in this relationship between US and Japan, military help is promised to Japan. So that's a, the problem. And if, I, if we try to undo it, it's gonna take uh, so much work. And uh, once again, this, there are so many moving parts in this. So yes, US has promised, but the, there's always a question to what extent US is willing to commit to helping Japan in case of crisis. And that's a big question. And also, can Japan sustain itself without US help? Perhaps it could, but that changes the whole dynamics of East Asian politics, right? If Japan will say and say, hey, we don't need US help anymore. We go this alone by buffing up, reinforcing our military self-defense forces and call them as military. That's one way, but that would not make China, South Korea, North Korea very happy. And that would be a huge international issue. So Japan is always treading this very difficult train in terms of negotiating. But for now, Japan's course is determined by what the arrangement made 1950s and 1960s and Japan, Japanese leaders are not at this point willing to go off from that scenario for better or worse. It is such a complicated history, Yoshi, and you at least got us to think about the fact that this history in terms of the Japanese uh, ability to muster a, a military or some kind of defense force is, is a long and very complex story there and this next one is also um, a very gets taps into a, a, a different complexity in Japanese history and this addresses Yoshi the the comments you made about um, fear of communism and containment of communism a bit more in this case asking about how the Japanese public felt about this Cold War alliance based around anti-communism, did the Japanese public feel like there was manipulation going on on the, on the part of the Americans and Japanese elites working with the Americans? Or was there really a kind of mass fear of Soviet and or communist influence? This is from- um, Yeah, that's an excellent question. And um, to simplify the picture here, uh, Japan was divided. Uh, there are those who preferred American occupation, American help. And on the other side of the picture, there are those who think that Japan will embrace Soviet style politics. So those people believe that Japan has to go through the revolution. Japan has to become socialist regime or communist regime for that matter. So between the two extremes, uh, people sort of you know, different positions existed. But the conflict was there. But I think the majority of people embraced American sort of a policy, American help uh, turning Japan into a uh, the bulwark against the Soviet tide. Because, you know, that is very beneficial. You know, you can see the progress of society, progress of the economy in front of your eyes, so revealing Americans came here to help for whatever reasons. And Japanese people, many of them are willing to accept. But others, once again, were very principled and the thinking that, and also this is sort of a anti, this sort of a disguised anti-Americanism. They're not happy that the, you know, Japan lost the war and uh, the victors came in and they, they redefined Japan. And the uh, Soviet Union offered counter image, counter uh, discourse against this American hegemony. Therefore they are eager, willing to embrace Soviet as a model. Also, China for that matter later on. Yeah, that's, it, it's so, um, it's such an, a fascinating period, Yoshi, about the Chinese revolution in 1949, communist presence in North Korea, Ho Chi Minh's success in North Vietnam, and those are all there, these areas where the Japanese, of course, had been as an imperial power and communist mm -hmm. movement sprouting up there and the impact that has back in Japan at the time.
we have a time for at least one more, Yoshi, and this one um, deals with, especially after hearing about the question about how the Japanese public responded to the trials of Japanese elites and the shock that those trials often produced. How do you explain this tendency in Japanese political culture to refuse to acknowledge war crimes or atrocities perpetrated uh, by the Japanese military during the 30s and 1940s? Um, once again, depending on what segment of society you're talking about, very top, uh, for example, even now, or they, they're throughout the post-war period, most of the time period, very top echelon of the political system was very conservative. They are into sort of maintaining sort of a anchoring Japan in a more traditional form of polity. But if you look at the middle section or the, you know, uh, wider section of Japanese society, I think that that segment was more willing to accept the Japan's responsibility in the war, Japan's atrocities. And if you widen the view and look at the, the wider populace, that's like, uh, you know, up for grab. So there you see whole different kind of positions in relation to that. So it's difficult to see why some of them are uh, unwilling to accept Japan's responsibilities because some of them, these people are invested in the continuity of history. Japan cannot change. Japan is, has to be always a certain way. But last segment society at the same time are interested in new Japan created in the interaction with the United States. And those people are willing to accept Japan's responsibilities more readily. And in between, depending on the political wind, the political climate, they can shift their positions. Well, you just, I think it's a fantastic point to conclude on you reminding us about um, not viewing Japanese culture is in any way unitary or monolithic. Their divisions, these things are contested and they have been really for decades and not to assume that there is unity on any of these huge historical issues pertaining to Japan's history during- And, and that's said, history. but nonetheless, some people have larger, the, the, the bigger voices to represent Japan than other people. Therefore, we tend to listen to the larger voices, which are you know, tend to be conservative. Yes, yes, those are often the voices I think many Americans hear, and yeah. <laughs> and then tend to assume that they do speak for the entire larger nation. segments, right, of the Japanese public than they actually, in fact, do. Yoshi, let me thank you so much for a superb conversation, really, about this decade after. World War II in Japan. I think we've all learned so much from it and uh, hope at some point we can do something with you again on this. And I want to, of course, thank our audience. We've had uh, some, some really outstanding questions and comments from our online viewers. And we hope that you will uh, join us here at the National World War II Museum again for future events. Thank you very much. Thank you.